My, my father would accept uh, other people making mistakes. For his children within the business, he would not accept that. Uh, and I even asked him one time when he was rather upset about something I did, and he said, you know, the, the, the people around you uh, are employees or the wrestlers and so forth that I can accept them making mistakes but you're my son and I cannot accept that because they'll use you as an example to make mistakes and do things wrong so uh, you know it was hard working for him but so he expected a lot out of you guys yes what kind of just kind of describe the way you look a lot of people say he was just a big man, but I mean, you told me he used to not be so big, but... Well, well you know, a big man. my father, and there again, I only remember him being big. Uh, I have pictures of him uh, when he and my mother got married, and uh, he's a very nice-looking gentleman. You know, as, as my mother said, he had a lot of suitors uh, following him around. Uh, so, uh, but she's the one that caught him. Uh, can I just talk about what he, what he did? What, like, um, a lot of people say he brought class and entertainment and this new, new breath of air to Charlotte when he came, not because he just did the boxing and the wrestling, but he did all kinds of stuff, right? Well, what he did, he was an entertainment promoter. Uh, when you say entertainment promoter, that covers the whole gamut. And he, you know, th that you have to have other things in your playbook, let's say, that if boxing and wrestling are doing well, well, maybe the big bands, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller are, or the show and dances uh, that he had, the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars, or the Harlem Globetrotters, or uh, Festival in the Park, or the Summer Theater, uh, Summer Pops, or uh, the Sportsman Show, boat and sportsman show that he had. You know, a lot of these he tried. He had to try everything. Some of them did not work. Uh, so, but he, being in entertainment, you have to provide uh, the people in the area what they're looking for. And you kind of since you told me he was kind of like the backbone of entertainment in Charlotte for a long, long time because he was backing things that he didn't necessarily. I, I thought he was. You know, that, that you know, uh, he was, uh, he backed the, the Charlotte Checkers, you know, when, uh, uh, with Al Match. He uh, did the, uh, backed the Summer Pops, the Summer Theater. Uh, summer Theater was always a loser, you know, as far as uh, money. Uh, he brought uh, My Fair Lady to Charlotte uh, right from Broadway, and I think he made a grand total of $150. You know, it sold out, but then you have all the, the cost of, of bringing stagehands down from New York and so forth. And, and it, you know, people enjoyed it, but, you know, you didn't make a lot of money at it. But why did he do it? To provide people entertainment. You know, we had the baseball team here. We didn't make, you know, millions of dollars or, or hundreds of thousands of dollars. We enjoyed it. 
you know, we enjoyed that old ballpark and going over there and uh, having Klondikeville run the tractor around and, and uh, in the infield and kids running around. Uh, my two children grew up at the ballpark. Uh, so, and my mother thoroughly enjoyed the baseball. So, you know, you do certain things because you like to. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to make money out of everything. You like to break even, at least. When, is, when was your earliest involvement in the wrestling side of the business? When what, did you first start doing what, it? As, as a kid, uh, I would, I guess in grade school, uh, I would go with the, uh, the ring crew and help set the ring up. I would sell programs or take tickets you know, just to be around dead on the weekends because, uh, you know, during the week is school and he was gone before we got home. Okay. A lot of people said they thought that uh, when you guys got older that your mother kind of didn't want you guys to get involved with the wrestling business, but your dad kind of did. Is that, you remember? I was the one that they did not want. I was the last one in the family to, uh, and I always wanted to be part of it, especially television end of it. Uh, but at that time, here in the Carolinas, there really was not a place to learn television unless you go to some place like you know, WBT or, you know, uh, Raleigh, WREL TV to, to learn the craft. Uh, and that just, you know, wasn't working. So, uh, and I was the the only one uh, still in college. I wasn't married, uh, and they uh, they just felt that you know why put everything in one basket. Uh, but I was always craving to go into it. And who tell tell us who David Finley was? What David Finley was you know you have uh, certain things like the uh, the Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Remember that uh, story? You know he would daydream uh, certain things and and I guess you know David Finley was my other side <laughs> yeah. and you were wanting to be a wrestler right well no uh, it was my dad said uh, I was an amateur wrestler and he said someone needs to know the other side of the business as far as those guys that are in the ring and they're doing uh, these different moves, uh, and he said, n you know, he, he was never in the ring, and, and uh, neither Jimmy, Jackie, or Francis, nobody in the family, and there again, I was single. Uh, I went, eh, why not? And, <laughs> you know, and the, but then I had people like Ole and Gene Anderson uh, uh, training me, you know, and Ole is a very sadistic individual. So so was Gene too. Uh, but I learned a lot from him. Uh, you know, and too, Sweet Hansen beat on me for a while. And, you know, and it was a way I maybe I was a sacrificial lamb. You know, if they were upset with uh, Dad as far as the payoff or anything like that, they could take it out on me. And when he first started wrestling, a lot of people say it was kind of a tag team territory. What are, what are your memories of some of those tag teams, like the Anderson brothers? Well, you know, an the Andersons came along later. You had, you know, some of the first ones I remember is George and Bobby Becker. And then, you know, then uh, Bobby Becker died. Then you had Johnny Weaver and George Becker. You know, you had Rip Hawk and Sweet Hanson. You had the Bolos. Uh, so you had Ernie and Emil, Ernie and Emil Dusik. Uh, were around. Uh, it, yeah, there were a lot of tag teams. I don't remember a lot of singles. Uh, Paul Anderson, uh, he had a single uh, single match, but they still put him with uh, tag teams. Uh, it was, you know, they'd break tag teams out into singles. Uh, so, and then they'd put more, you know, they have a manager, and then the manager would have to come in and wrestle. So. You'd have a six man. I guess it gave more uh, options. Okay. Um, in April of '73, your dad passed away, and uh, they said it was, your brother said it was kind of unexpected. What was 
obviously, you know, losing the figurehead of a family is tough. What was that like, you know, for the family around when that happened? He wasn't supposed to die. He just wasn't. Uh, you know, he and mom, he, they were talking about he was going to go to Duke for the rice diet. and You know, he just didn't last that 72 hours. Uh, and, you know, yeah, because he ran the, the company out of his coat pocket or shirt pocket. And all the knowledge was in his head or in that pocket. Uh, it was, you know, devastating, really. Uh, you know, he was, you know, uh, besides the business, the family, you know, it, it was, you better do what he says. And, and you know, it's not like Dallas or something, you know, it was, you better do it. And, and, and you end up always doing it. And Ted was one of those people that, you know, you respect or fear or both. Uh, talk about the funeral. You know, I read in some of the old newspaper clippings and a lot of people have talked about how well he was respected, not just in the community, but in the wrestling business. Just kind of take us to your memories of that day and who you saw and, and what kind of the, all the people that showed up to pay just respects to your dad. Well, that day's a blur, really, to me, you know, uh, uh, you know one thing is, you know, I was walking, you know, uh, outside with Jimmy, and I said, you know, you know, I never said that I loved him, and you know, it was, you just didn't do that, you know, it was one of those things, and, and uh, that just, even today, you know, eats me up. Uh, I made sure that I did that with my mother, but uh, you know, it's there were, you know, it. As my wife said, she was, she couldn't understand, you know, here mom was, dad had passed away, and she was cooking all this food for all these people in the house, you know, had all these chairs around the wall and uh, in every room, and she was, as, you know, my wife said, he, she was slaving away in the kitchen, but that was her way of handling her grief. Uh, you know, you had the, uh, the kang royal kangaroos, I think they were around at that time, and uh, just I think every wrestler I, I could think of were were there. Then, you know, a lot of Dad's friends outside of wrestling uh, were there, and, and they, you know, they were the ones that after the funeral, you know, you have a funeral, and uh, but then a lot of those people, ninety percent of them, leave. Uh, and, you know, it might be that 90% come to just to be part of it or that they come uh, to be part, to be a witness. I was there. I don't know. You, you just, I was dealing with it internally. So. And around this time, wrestling had became the main focus of the family business. Yes, you know, that, that is true. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I left school, uh, especially when Dad uh, passed away, and uh, really never looked back, uh, and uh, just did it. Yeah. Um, the man that took over after your father died was John Ringling. Yes. We don't need to get into what all happened, but what what was that like? I mean. Was there an assumption that somebody that you or David or Francis might take over? Or oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we never thought he was going to die. Come on. Uh, it was... Johnny had been with the dad longer. Jimmy, Jimmy was... was Jimmy was quieter in the background. He was, you know, Johnny was the, the consummate salesman. You know, uh, uh, Jackie was around, uh, but, you know, yeah, we, we, we sort of chose Johnny and that you know, definitely hurt Jimmy. Uh, and, you know, we lived to regret it uh, and, you know, that, 
you know, Jimmy was, I guess, who we should have picked, but then, you know, we, uh, to see him and what he did, you know, with the company after, after Johnny left was fantastic. But weren't you guys all equal partners, equal shareholders in the company? You can only have one boss. Yeah, there's one boss, but then you get, then you guys kind of, that's kind of what I was hearing. I just want to Yeah, we're, we're all equal, you know, but, you know, if we had a problem, we'd step out back and stroke it out. But you know, as far as, you know, uh, but there was only one boss. It's, uh, and you could, you cannot uh, argue in front of wrestlers or anyone else, you know, that, that, that person had to be the person. You said there's one boss, but it's obviously a family business. Yes. Talk about the pressure that you guys had to follow in the footsteps of your father. I mean, that must have oh, been. well, think about it. He was the person that everyone knew that he was Jim Crockett Promotions. So when he passed away, for all intents and purposes, there was no Jim Crockett Promotions. Uh, you know, and we had to recreate ourselves, uh, and and we did. Yes, it was extremely hard, uh, and uh, luckily there were a lot of people uh, outside the wrestling business that had faith in that we could do it. You know, I'm talking about banks and the the coliseums. You know, it would you know with without. You know, and people at the newspaper, TV stations, you know, if they didn't think we could, then you know, I wouldn't be here today. Right. Uh, one of the decisions that John Ringley made while he was in charge was to bring in uh, George Scott as the booker. What did you think of the job that George Scott did when he took over for the company? He did. He did very well. You know, uh, we had some good times. You know, uh, you know, he, he did extremely well for a very long time. George and I were not bosom buddies. Uh, you know, his loyalty was to Jimmy. And a lot of people give him credit for, you know, changing the tag teams to single wrestling a lot and bringing in guys like Johnny Valentine and Wahoo McDowell. That was the smartest thing, you know, if, when you talk about it. Yes, he was very successful, and we had to go through that period of time you, know, you, met, you mentioned Johnny Valentine. Johnny Valentine, when he first came in, he would grab someone, let's say uh, Johnny Weaver, in an arm hole on the mat and stay there for 30 minutes. The crowd was booing him. And then finally Johnny would do something or, or Johnny Valentine would do something crowd would just go crazy and the control that he had over the crowd he you know talking to him he, he said you know that he wanted them to start booing so when something happened he would you know they would just go crazy and and he also said the most he was more comfortable in the ring at peace than out of the ring and I said, I don't see how that is because I've watched matches between you and Wahoo McDaniels and the blood would just come off your chest for Wahoo was hitting you. And he said, yes, and it felt so good. <laughs> yes. Mm. So I guess around this time was when you started getting into on-camera work, doing the announcing and the interviews. Is that, when did you start doing that? Was that around this time period? Yes, it was. We. Um, we had an announcer. Uh, we were uh, producing our shows at WRL TV at that time, and when we got there, uh, the announcer showed up and he was drunk. So Jimmy and I flipped a coin, and I lost. So I had to announce, and that's how it started. And then, two, uh, the one, the the interviews that we did at the office. Uh, we had to have somebody there. Jimmy did them some, I did them some, but then when Jimmy uh, took over the company, then I ended up doing them. Can you imagine it being written reverse after all these years? 
No, J you know, Jimmy, you know, Jimmy did a, a good job. Uh, you know, there, there are certain things that, you know, uh, I wish he'd had listened. You know, I could see certain things that were going on, you know, but, you know, that's the past. Yeah. Well, you can't dwell on the past. Yeah. I'll ask you a little bit about that yeah. later. And by the way, I'm not going to go into the past. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully just a little bit, but not too much. All right. Um, is this, you know, Johnny Valentine, Wahoo McDaniel, is this when you really started seeing the business increasing and the money start to come in a little bit more? Yes, the, the, the audit, audience uh, started picking up in the arenas. The uh, TV ratings uh, started doing extremely well. Uh, and wrestling was something that people wanted to watch. You know, if you look at wrestling, uh, wrestling, the demographics are just about the same as NASCAR. So we had, you know, but NASCAR was socially acceptable and, and wrestling was not. You would have people, you know, come by, you're, you're somewhere and they say, oh yeah, my kids were watching it and I was, you know, or uh, I was walking past the, the television it, and it was on, but the more you talk to these quote, non-wrestling fans, you found out that they were wrestling fans, as I call them, my closet wrestling fans, because they just, it was socially unacceptable to say you were a wrestling fan at that time. But nowadays, that it, it's acceptable to be a wrestling fan. And one of the guys told us that the biggest stars were, NAS around here were NASCAR drivers and wrestlers, but it was always wrestlers were the king. Why, why do you think that was? Do you, do you even agree with that? Well, around here, uh, yeah, we, ha we had the Richard Petties and, and Buddy Baker and, and uh, you know, of course, Fireball Roberts and, you know, uh, uh, Ned Jarrett. And, uh, they were not out in the public eye all the time, whereas wrestlers, every week, you saw them somewhere. You know, uh, you know, the NASCAR uh, was only here part time. Uh, we even had a dirt track in Raleigh that was NASCAR sanctioned. Uh, that uh, Richard Petty would come up there all the time and, and race. Okay, um, I was a show in Wilmington one night, and uh, you were on this plane. Just kind of take us back to that day when you were flying out to Wilmington, and just kind of talk a little bit about what happened. Well, that day. Jimmy called me, he was sick, and asked if I would go uh, with, to go to Wilmington, and I said yes, and he said, oh, by the way, there's a plane going, and, you know, he was going to be on it, so you take my place, and I said, okay, uh, and at that time, my son was two weeks old, and it was a beautiful day, what I remember, I used to be in the Air National Guard, Guard was meeting that uh, that day because I saw my old Major, Major Thompson, out on the tarmac uh, as we were uh, going to the plane. It was a Cess twin engine Cessna 402 Charlie Alpha, if I remember correctly. And we, I made a joke. Uh, the pilot was testing the, the fuel and you know, there was something under the wing and I said, well, I hope you're not dumping all that fuel, you know, we, we might need it. You know, little did I know that, you know, he didn't put enough in. So on the way to Wilmington, the, the engine started to sputter around Lumberton. To this day, I don't know why we didn't land in Lumberton or divert over to Florence. They have a perfectly good runway in Florence. Uh, also uh, in Lumberton, there's, you know, they're private, or they're just runways around. Well, we continued, and as we were approaching over the Cape Fear River, the other engine started to sputter, and I'm sitting in the very back, on the left-hand side, Tim Woods, Mr. Wrestling's in front of me, Bob Brugger's uh, wrestler beside me, 
I mean, beside me, then Ric Flair was uh, up to my right, Johnny Valentine was in the co-pilot seat. And I said, this thing crashes in the water, I'm not getting out of here. Yeah, especially going forward, it's not going to happen. I looked back and uh, the luggage compartment door was there and I said, if I make it, I'm going to try to go through that door. Don't know, you know, uh, if I'd be scared enough to, to bust it or something. And I tried to control my breathing. I, I remember bending over and kissing my knees, uh, trying to control my breathing. I was thinking I didn't want to get the, the breath knocked out of me. Uh, and since my son was two weeks old, I was trying to do some of that Lamaze breathing. Uh, needs to say I got knocked out. And that's all I remember. You know, Johnny Valentine, when I asked him afterwards, he, he said, be thankful you don't remember. Because he and I were the last ones they took out of the plane. And uh, the whole time he thought he had his legs caught under something. And he said, you could smell the gas. You know, you know I can tell you what was in the FAA report, you know, that my wife at one time read to me. but. Other than that, you know, um, I don't remember a lot. And that kind of changed the territory since you guys lost Johnny Valentine after that with, the, with his para, being paralyzed after that. Right. Just kind of talk about, I guess Black Jack Mulligan kind of came in and took that spot. What did you think of him? I like Black Jack. You know, uh, but now as far as the plane crash, I was let's say uh, my head injuries uh, concussion lasted for a good six months. So as far as remembering a lot that was going on, no. I really don't. Uh, I, I sort of remember things what people might have told me, but you know, I, I, I don't. You know, it's just not there. Let's talk about just the time period a little bit after that when you when you come back and I guess you're back to announcing and all the way up to about like 83. People kind of classify that as the mid-Atlantic years. What, what do you remember about those years? Because that's when people say it was the business was doing real, real well. You guys were making a lot of good money. You had a lot of young talent such as young Ric Flair, Steamboat. What, do you, what are your memories of those years? That we were producing our own programs, that we had our own production truck, that we would go out and produce our TV show, come back that night. Uh, if we need to do any editing, we would edit, and then we would dub all night long. And then the next day, we would do interviews all day long, and then ship the shows out that night, put the commercials into the shows, and ship them out that night. We had 82 stations that uh, aired our wrestling program. And a lot of them were not in our area. It was just general managers, program directors would, that had been here uh, in the Carolinas would be somewhere else and say, I need a, a lead in to my news. And I remember uh, your show and what it did for our news. Uh, can you ship me a show? Sure. And, and it was, that's, you know, that's the way it was. Uh, as far as, yes, I mean, the. The fans were great. The wrestling was was fantastic. Uh, you know, I just remember it down at down in Shelby. We had the Rock and Roll Express. You know, wrestling. I think it was uh, Ivan and Nikita Koloff. Well, we went off the air. You know, with that and and Bob Cottle and I were hoarse because we were we were big fans. I mean, we just got in into it. It was, it was just something that, that we had fun. Yeah, and we, we were having a great time, working real hard. Uh, the wrestlers the same way. Uh, I think probably one of Nikita Koloff's highlights was when he clotheslined me. Uh, you know, <laughs> he even said, you know, I've always wanted to do that. You, he said, I just irritated the hell out of him. I went, Oh well. 
When do you, how did you like working with Bob Cottle all those years? Oh, Bob was a great teacher. Great teacher. Uh, he's a wonderful person. Really is. Uh, and, you know, it, uh, he was, it, at one point, he was in charge of production there at WRAL TV in Raleigh. Uh, and so, uh, and then he would come that night and, uh, you know, uh, announce, and, and really I learned a lot from him. You said you guys were having fun and having fun with the wrestlers. A lot of the guys said that you, even though you guys were running the promotion, you guys were kind of like one of the boys. Just kind of talk about some of that fun you had with them and <laughs> what you guys were doing. Well, uh, it was, you know, if you had, well, take Ric Flair. You know, you, you go to a, a bar or a restaurant with, with Rick and, you know, Rick was drink till it closes and order three shots for everybody when it closes so you can still drink. Uh, and it was, it was, it was rough. You know, it, it was, you know, the fans liked it, uh, them being around, uh, they were, you know, great people. Roddy Piper came in, you know, a, a short time after, uh, when all that was taking place and he was crazy. You get Rick and, and Roddy together, you know, it, it's just, you know, I'm glad that a lot of the stuff they did was here in Charlotte. At least we knew the police. <laughs> Keep them out of trouble. And they knew the police. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. But you, would you say you, you and your brother were just like one of the boys? In some ways, yes, uh, because we had, you know, Jimmy more so than I, uh, because they wanted to get real close to him, you know, since he was the man uh, that, you know, they, you know, some of them, you know, you'd say that if Jimmy stopped real fast, we'd have to get a crowbar and pry their head out of, you know what. But uh, uh, some of them, uh, and all of them, they, they respected him, and uh, it, it, was, it was great. I think shortly after George Scott left, uh, what are your memories of him leaving? Uh, I know Jimmy talked about he had something going on in Toronto and it kind of caused some friction. But what, do you, what do you remember of that, about him leaving? It was not a good time. There, uh, there were a lot of bad feelings. Uh, you know, that, and uh, the production at that time, uh, the, the ratings were going down and you know, it, there needed to be a, uh, he needed to recreate himself or in the, in the, the booking uh, and trying the same old things were not working and something had to give. He was getting kind of stale as the booker is what you're saying? Maybe. I'm saying that, that No, I don't want to say stale, uh, that every, every business has that period of time in which you, you've got to recreate. Uh, you, you just can't sit back and, and, and uh, count on your reputation. Uh, you've got to get in there and do something. I think I know what you're saying. Uh, I guess, I think after him, Ole, there might have been somebody else before him. I think it might have been Weaver and Hanson or something, but I don't think that was short-lived. Right. Um, Ole Anderson came in as the booker while he was also booking Georgia. Mm -hmm. Why did you guys decide to select him to do that and Georgia at the same time? We respected him. We trusted him. You know, that's, you know, in the wrestling business, that's hard to do, uh, trust someone. Uh, but uh, you could trust Ole. You know, as obnoxious as he can be, irritating, you can trust him. You know, he will definitely tell you what's on his mind. Uh, but then uh, you have to listen to him. And he's not just blowing steam uh, to hear himself talk. Uh, you have to listen to him. Would you say he had too much on his plate trying to run this territory and another one? 
You'd have to ask him that. Well, I did. He he said that he thought that you guys wanted to get rid of him because he was complaining about having to come up with so much for this place and this guy and this guy and this guy. He just thought that you guys got tired of hearing him complain about that. That's for, that's for his words. Well, he's a chronic complainer. Yeah. He thought you guys wanted <laughs> He to wouldn't be it. happy unless he was complaining. Uh, but the traveling back and forth, you know, it's, it's nothing against uh, him doing both places. It's just that uh, we felt that we needed someone here, you know, that, uh, you know, and he was in Georgia. He had, uh, had his family down there. He had uh, land down there uh, and uh, they were doing it fantastic so how are you guys doing how was the business it wasn't doing too well was it? Was no it kind of stale? no it was it was it was in that uh, lull I guess you would say yeah I guess you got I guess what you just said was you needed somebody here to pay attention to it and, and help it grow instead of right you have to you have to to, to jump in feet first and and uh, waller in it and and uh, feel it and, and you can't just you know uh, one day or two days uh, decide you know or be part of it it doesn't work that way you know you have to be there on a, on a daily basis go to the events uh, and uh, Participate around there. Listen to uh, the wrestlers complain uh, and uh, about this and that, and uh, they want to do this, they want to do that, or they've got someone that uh, a wrestler from somewhere else that uh, they think is good and like to come in. Have to pay attention to it. Now after Holy was, I think you guys selected Dory Funk Jr. to, to book a little while. A little while. Explain why it was just a little while, and he had a uh, committee that booked with him. Uh, what did you think of that? And, and then also say why it was just a little while he was here. It got him rather bloody, uh, let's say. And uh, television, you cannot bleed violence. Uh, you know the the shock value. You, that's. You know, we definitely, when we start getting complaints from television station, uh, and two, you've got to remember that, you know, it sounds crazy, but it's a family show. And that uh, young people, you know, uh, need to be able to watch it. We need to entertain them. That I don't want them having bad dreams about what's going on. Uh, so, and, you know, and yeah, that worked uh, some places, but it, it didn't work here. Um, around this time, Jimmy reached out to Dusty to come in and book the first Starcade. Um, what did you think of that? Well, wait a minute. Final conflict happened when Greensboro called Sam where they had to turn away a lot of people. What are your memories of that, that match, the cage match with uh, Slaughter and Cronodal and against Steamboat and Youngblood? You remember that night? I mean, it was a sellout, or yeah, they they went on TV and told people to to quit coming. That there was no more tickets left. They had to they shut down the interstate. Well, see, I know. Well, you know, we sold out Greensboro quite a lot. Uh, I guess that was uh, I don't know how to where we. T I'm trying to figure out. Was that that was just a regular house match then? Yeah, they built they built up to the just that one match, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just, I guess it was just a house show. It wasn't on. TV. I'm sure I was there, but uh, right. I'm sure it was bloody. Yeah. You know, you had Don Cronodal, uh and uh, slaughter. Slaughter. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, what are your memories of Dusty coming in and booking the first Starcade? He was, Starcade was um, definitely a, 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 a different, uh, it was exciting, 
you know, that uh, people enjoyed it. It was more like a, producing a, a show. You know, everybody had to have their entrance music. You had to have uh, pyrotechnics. Uh, that's, I, I remember that I was calling around. I called uh, Verilite. I uh, happened to watch, uh, 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 who was it, uh, Phil Collins, that's it, Phil Collins. I watched his video and I saw all these lights and I said, I need to find out about those lights. And I finally got around and uh, I called them up and they said, you're who, with whom? And I told them again and I said, I want to rent your lights. And, and, and they didn't believe me at first, and then I kept on and kept on. And then uh, I hired a lighting company. We had uh, uh, La Luna Tech, Power Tech, Pyrotechnics, which was the leading company in the United States for pyro. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was fun. That definitely was fun. Did you see this big show concept becoming the norm down the road? Or? Did you guys just think it was kind of like a one one shot deal? Oh, I didn't think I didn't think it was a one shot deal. Uh, I, you know, I saw you know it, it is definitely a um, a big show the project. Now the thing is that you can try to put too much glitz into it and forget about what's in the ring. Uh, you know, it's it's like everything is from the dressing room to the ring. And then you forget about what's in the ring. You need to uh, think about both, and also that the cost of this from the dressing room to the ring. What were your what were your initial impressions of Dusty Rhodes when he came in for that show? Oh, I, I liked it. I mean, you know, as far as uh, uh, what he was doing, you know, he was he was. He's a good salesman. You know, he's, he's Dusty Rhodes. You know, he can turn it on and turn it off. How did he get the booking, the booking job? I, I've been told that Dory didn't really know he was going to be losing that position. And did you he, ask Jimmy? Yeah, well, he kind of he said Dory didn't really know he was going to lose the job, and he just wanted to have Dusty, Dusty come in, so I guess. Jimmy's the boss. I didn't even know Dusty was coming in. I could tell it when he got here, you know, just for that one show. And it was that Dusty was going to uh, be crea the creative person for, for these big shows. Uh, and, uh, you know, but, you know, as much as I like Dory, it was, Dory every now and then, you know, you have to check his pulse. To see if he's, you know, he's, you know, you look, you look at uh, Dory, and and he's not like his brother. It's not like his old man, you know. He's he's Dory Funk, and he's very s slow and precise. You know, he's so like Johnny Valentine in a lot of ways. What did you think of Dusty Rhodes as a booker once he came in and started running things? Uh, it was very exciting. Uh, it was. You know, uh, he was going here and there, and, and uh, he knew a lot of people in the entertainment business. Uh, uh, he was, you know, he was Jimmy's guy. Um, Jimmy said he had his faults. What, what do you think some of his faults were? He said, well, everybody has their own faults. But That's you, right. What do you think some of Dusty's faults were? A lot of people said he was, he's Dusty Rose, he's bigger than life. He, Big spending, big living, uh, didn't know how to have a budget. What did you think of? Did some of these shows have budgets, or did just Dusty just kind of over override that? Or what? What are your what's your opinion on that? Well, the 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 shows definitely uh, had a big price tag, and no, there was not a budget. Uh, I tried to sometimes get a budget, uh, but you know, 
didn't happen. Uh, and that was something I, I kept on harping on. I think that was probably Jimmy and I got in more discussions about, you know, that, you know, why are we uh, having all this entertainment, uh, you know, rock bands or uh, country bands and all this pyrotechnics and so, so we're forgetting about what's in the ring. Uh, and the cost, you know, just, you know, it goes back to uh, My Fair Lady. You know, if you're, if it costs you $100,000 and you make a, a $105,000, it's, and you still have to pay your wrestlers, it doesn't, doesn't really work, does it? Uh, you guys were kind of getting the territory turned around and getting hot and getting big business going, but the thing that a lot of people point to is getting on TBS and getting that Turner time slot. What do you? I know the story about purchasing it from McMahon, but kind of. We were asked to purchase it because. How were you asked? By who were you asked? To Jim, to that, you you just, really, you, Jimmy and believe it or not, Ted Turner were were. Uh, they uh, talked quite a lot, and it was that Vince McMahon and Ted Turner it was like oil and water. Uh, they just didn't see eye to eye. You, know, you had two very strong personalities, and it was suggested to Jimmy that uh, we buy the contract to uh, TBS, uh, and so we did. And then in return, what did McMahon do with that money? Oh, he, he financed the first WrestleMania. So Vince, please thank me for this. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I, now I have to say too, you know, with Vince, uh, I I do respect him. Yeah, you know, uh, last man standing. Uh, uh, you, you have to respect that. I know you said it's in the past, but you had, you ever look back and wonder what if what what if it would have been us, or do you wish it would have been you guys, or? Of course, I, I wish I was still in it, but I'm not. Uh, I, you know, I, I can't live that way. I can't live in the past. Uh, uh, you know, I would, you know, it was a, an adrenaline rush. Every, every show, you know, it was live television. And, uh, you know, it's, you don't get a second chance. What did that TBS do for you guys? What kind of it gave you a whole lot more exposure for the talent? And for well, it did, and it also uh, for us with Vince, is it protected us from him, and that was the one of the main logics behind that, for us to protect ourselves from from Vince taking over uh, everything was to use TBS showing our product to the nation and making it the most exciting wrestling there is. And we did. And, you know, we, we would make little uh, trips up to uh, New York, uh, you know, to, uh, to the Meadowlands, uh, to Nassau Coliseum, and use TBS to promote it, just to do it. You know, uh, and uh, it worked. We had a lot of good wrestling fans up there. So just kind of explain to everyone, you, before that, you guys were Virginia, North and South Carolina, but then after that, your territory kind of became the country. Just kind of explain that to people there. That... Well, what it was is that TBS was such a huge success that other wrestling promoters uh, wanted uh, to put their wrestlers on our show to uh, promote them. Uh, and so we did, you know, because uh, we, we also wanted them to survive so we could survive. You know, the more uh, people we had in his way, Vince, the better off uh, we were. So the mindset was, Let's not let Vince take us over at, at that Sure. Time. Wow, wow. I mean, because you guys were drawing 
big what? crowd, you guys were hot. I mean, why what? Why, why was the mindset to protect yourselves from Vince? Well, because if we, ha if we didn't have TBS, we used TBS to promote our, our, our big shows. And audiences, uh, even locally in the area, uh, would think anything all coming off of TBS was something very special. Even though they're looking at our local program, it's sort of like uh, looking at uh, a local show or uh, looking at uh, HBO, let's say. Uh, and, you know, they, they thought it was better, even though it was some of the same people. Okay. One of the, the, the four horsemen kind of formed around this, this uh, time period. What are you, mm -hmm. Were you on the set when Orrin cut that promo, or was that someone else? Or do you remember? When you cut the promo about being the horseman and the apocalypse and all that. I'm, I'm sure I was because I, I, let me see, I went through, when we were first there, I did some announcing on one show but not another show and then I ended up doing uh, with Tony Schiavone. Tony came in later on. We had Gordon Soley for a while and then I'm trying to remember, um, we had someone else at first too. So uh, I know part of that time I was there for the, the Four Horsemen because, you know, it just, it, in some cases, you know, they were unbelievable when it came to, to doing interviews. It was, you know, truly ad lib. You never knew what they were going to say, any of them. And some of the stuff that they would come up with, you know, you want to laugh, but you know you can't. Uh, it, it was that was some of the, the the best times I had was doing interviews with those guys, and then watching their work in the ring too. Who was your favorite interview out of all those all wrestlers? Golly, I always enjoyed Roddy Piper, Rick, uh, Tully, uh, and JJ would would get in there. Uh, Ole Anderson, I mean. Th you know, those guys, you, uh, really, you could just stand there and, and be sort of a, a human mic stand, and they would, you know, just go off. What did the Four Horsemen add to Jim Crockett Promotions? I mean, they were kind of the epitome of a bad guy, but people started to... They loved to hate them. People would love to hate them. Uh, it was, and you're going, uh, what do you mean, love to hate? You would have people come to the, the, the arenas and they would throw things at them, try to hit them, yet they would be the first people outside wanting their autograph. You know, and it was a love-hate. And uh, it's, it was the respect they had for them outside the ring uh, because they, all of the horsemen, uh, put in 110% in the ring. What was business like at this time? I guess anywhere you went, it was probably a sellout, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, it would, uh, arenas, high school gyms, uh, everywhere we went, you know, it was selling out. You, know, you, you were talking about Wilmington. You know, you look at Wilmington, you go down, down there, and you have 6,000 people in an outdoor football stadium, you know, or even more, you know, and, and it might be, threatening rain, but those people still came. Why is that? What were you guys offering them that was so, I guess, irresistible? <laughs> the wrestlers, the four horsemen, the, the, the matchups, the, the charisma of, of those people in the ring. It was, you know, it was contagious. People enjoyed what they were watching on television. So that motivated them to come out and see it in person. And when they saw it in person, they thoroughly enjoyed it, so they came back. Over and over, right? Yes. Uh, Magnum T.A. was, in 86, was... He was the heir apparent. Magnum was the heir apparent as far as world champion. Uh, he, the camera loved him. You now, he had that uh, charisma and just in body language. 
uh, uh, Clint Eastwood would, you know, if you look at his early movies, he never really said anything. It was a look. And Magnum had the look. So, you know, the women loved him. Uh, kids loved him. Uh, adults, you know, he, uh, he identified with the wrestling fan. You get the phone call, he has an accident. What, oh. What's your reaction? I couldn't believe it. None of it's good. You know, it was that, you know, he had that uh, Porsche and just wasn't quite used to the, the weight of it and hit ice and spun out. You know, I, you know, he shouldn't be alive, but he is. He was so determined, you know, that uh, to live. And it's, I see him every now and then. How did that affect uh, the business? What were you guys, I know obviously Nikita kind of came in and took his place, but how did that affect uh, the business? Uh, it did. Uh, I mean, but business had to go on. The, the business was good, even, even you know, with Magnum, uh, you know, not around. It's just, it could have been better if he were, you know, that uh, really he was, he was going to be the star. You could just see it yeah. in him. And wrestling at this time kind of became WWF, and it kind of came down to, two promotions, WWF and Jim Crockett promotions at this time, and you guys were continuing, still going all over the country with TBS, and why did you guys start purchasing other people's territories, such as Florida and Kansas City, and uh, the one that most people talk about is Bill Watts, UWF. What was the logic behind doing that instead of just letting them just die out and then going out and taking over? We really didn't purchase Florida okay. or Kansas City. We did purchase. Jimmy purchased Bill Watts. He shouldn't have. Uh, because he just shouldn't have. You know, he, you know, Jim Ross talked him into it. Uh, and, and Vince, you know, was part of it too. You know, he was making overtures that he was going to buy it. Uh, and, but that, that was a mistake. Why? Why? Yeah. Paid money for something you didn't need to pay money for. That's why. You take, you take, took on debt, which you shouldn't, you know, that, uh, you need to do due diligence. There were a lot of TV contracts that were not paid that sort of rose up uh, after the, the purchase. But what was the, uh, Jimmy explained what the wrestling network was. What did you, what was your take on the wrestling network that he was creating with all this national syndication all over the country and, the, and TBS? Do you remember the wrestling mm -hmm. network? What was that? I mean, he kind of gave us his answer, but what was? It was trying to create a another show that uh, that we could put on throughout the United States, uh, a, a network of different stations, uh, syndicated stations. Uh, that was my understanding. Okay. Uh, the purchase of Watts, how much of Dusty Rhodes was that? Because, you know, he was from Texas and the office was based out of Dallas, Texas. You need to ask Jimmy. Well, I can't anymore. I guess you're out of luck then. <laughs> well, what about the movie business? Were you guys really going to try to get into the movie business? Because a lot of people have said that that was one of the things they moved out there for. <sighs> well, if you're, gonna, if you're going to go in the movie business, uh, you really need to move to uh, Hollywood, right? Uh, but yeah, I know that, uh, and I was even with Dusty when he, Willie Nelson and old El Paso, and uh, we did an interview down there, and you know, uh, of course Dusty would love to be a movie star. You know that, but I, you know, no, we weren't gonna go in the movie business. Okay. Not that I know of. Okay, 
there were a few, few of the guys that said that that's what they heard, and I just wanted to clear that up. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, like I told you when we met, I was just going to ask you what happened. So just what happened? Where did, why did you guys wind up selling? Well, there are a lot of reasons. One reason is Ted said if we don't sell, he was going to kick us off his station, and he could stand it longer than we could, which is true. We had the top three programs on his station, uh, and you know he couldn't afford to have an outsider control his destiny. Uh, two, the, the um, there was, um, as you mentioned, I think earlier, as far as the shows, costing more than what was coming through the gate. That you know, uh, Great American Bash, you know. Why don't we just go out there and create a bonfire? You know, that yeah, it was exciting to do, uh, but it was not, uh, was not a moneymaker. Uh, you're paying so much in, in production for uh, opening acts that, you know, the, the, the wrestling was just sort of a side part of it. It was a good time, all right. Yeah, it was hard working. Uh, you know, it was something that I pride myself in being able to pull it off. Now I had a lot of great people working with me, or I'd never been able to do it. We talked to Magnum, and he said that he thought it was the contracts that you guys started offering that was what really hurt you guys. What did you? What's your take on the whole contract situation? Because it used to be paid by performance, right? And then, no matter what they did, they were still going to get paid. It's, What's your take on that? The, the contracts, you know, for part of that, we had to, to Vince was giving them contracts. So uh, uh, Jimmy was uh, some of the wrestlers he offered contracts to. Uh, some of them, of course, left. You look at Roddy Piper, he, he left. Uh, you know, so... Uh, now eventually, Steamboat went up there. Uh, you know, there were, but we, you know, I I agree that uh, there shouldn't be contracts. But you know, I, I look at WCW. Contracts killed them, killed them dead. You know, at one point, there were seventeen million dollars worth of talent that was not working. Just because they might have had a back injury, supposedly, or they were sick, or something. Some people also say it was Dave Johnson, the accountant, who just, they said he was in over his head, he didn't know what he was doing. What's your response to that? I disagree. Dave Johnson knew what he was doing. Dave Johnson was holding up the red flags the whole time. He was not being paid attention to. When you say he wasn't being paid attention to, by who? Uh, by management. You didn't want to sell. No. Well, what Did not. What made what convinced you to, that you should just go along with it? My mother. They pulled the mother car on. Yes, they did. And what what did she say? I she said, David. This is the very best thing. And you have to do it. And I respect my mother, uh, and so I, I did it. You told me that your brother was snake bitten by Dusty Rhodes. Yes, he was. Well, what do you mean? Well, he. Because Blinded by, you know, it wouldn't listen to Dave Johnson, uh, didn't listen to me. Uh, you could see it, what was going on. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, right. you know. But, you know, that, that is in the past. Yeah, it always is in the past. Yes. Oh. When did you see the red flags? When did you notice something should be should be changed? What was there a year or 
a situation that when we started doing all these these uh, shows with these entertainers, uh, you know the, the uh, what is it, uh, Alabama and, and di different acts before a show, and I'm going, all right, why are we paying them all this money? Uh, why don't you just why don't you have a show in arena with them and then have a wrestling match? You know, let them pay us. Uh, it, you know, it it didn't up the gates any. So, uh, you know, it just was another inroad to, you know, try to be part of the, the entertainment world. So your brother, when we spoke to him yesterday, he took full responsibility for what happened, but some people also want to say it was Dusty Rhodes' fault, that he, they kind of, he kind of led him down that path. He did. Dusty did. Uh, you know, you can't say he didn't. Uh, uh, but uh, that happened. Okay. You know that. You know, I I don't respect Dusty for what he did. Uh, he knew what he was doing. No matter what he says, he knew exactly what he was doing. What's the legacy of Jim Crockett Promotions? Because like I told you, you know, there's 50 years of this promotion and it's not just what happened at the end, it's everything. There was more success than failure. Well, I'd like to think that, you know, that uh, to live with it not being here today is, is hard. Uh, you know, that, uh, you know, to have uh, my son, my grandchildren, uh, to just see what uh, my father had created uh, would have been terrific. I mean, it would be fantastic. Uh, you know, that uh, he, he did things that you don't do today, uh, a handshake instead of a contract. Uh, you know, I learned that. I did that at Turner. All my vendors, it was a handshake. I would not sign anything. And I said, you know, as long as you do your job, everything's going to be fine. If you don't do your job, then you're gone. It's pretty simple. Uh, and uh, that's the way it was. And you just, you said numerous times it's in the past, and, I, and of course it's in the past, but just kind of tell people. <laughs> <laughs> just tell people. You keep on digging, don't no, you? No, no, no. I, I told you this when we met. Just tell the people, the fans out there that, that can't get enough of it, that keep coming back 30 years later, that it's, it's over, you guys have moved on. That's a, that, well, that you, you, never, you never move on. It's, it's always back there. Uh, and, and to those fans that, that love it, you know, I appreciate that. I really do. That, you know, it's... It's, it shows we did something right. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's my vindication uh, of what happened later on, uh, that they had as much fun going to those matches as, as we had producing and promoting those matches. Uh, it was, you know, as Dusty Rhodes would say, you never forget who brought you to the dance. And that is very true. And to those fans, I, I want to thank you because it was great. It was a great ride. Uh, it was, you know, I, yeah, I, I guess I do still daydream about it. Uh, you know, at that, you know, to have people come up to you and, and uh, say how much they enjoyed it and get these uh, letters of, you owe me a TV, uh, TV set because my, Granddad got so mad he used a shotgun and shot the TV set. You know, <laughs> you start laughing and then get letters from North Carolina School of the Deaf and, and uh, no, North Carolina School of the Blind and how they uh, enjoyed watching the matches. And you go, you know, what, what, you know and, and they, they talked about how they could feel what was going on. 
that they were, you know, right at ringside. They could, they could hear that pounding. They could hear the sweat uh, when somebody got, you know, when Wahoo hit somebody. And, and uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's one of those things. Like Jackie was a fantastic cameraman. He would take a hit. I mean, he'd get in the way just to get, you know, the picture. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, yeah, I, I would go back. Uh, and and do it again. I would. Uh, yeah, of course, there'll be some things I'd like to change. Okay, I'm not going to dig anymore. Just kind of tell everybody what you've been up to since I know you went on and have a career with WCW, and now I guess you're just re retired. Mm -hmm. Retired. I, 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 because of, of the wrestling business and, and everything, that I could not spend as much time with my children as I wanted to. I'm trying to play catch up with my grandchildren and I'm having a ball doing that. I uh, volunteer here uh, in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County for uh, Loaves and Fishes, which they feed, uh, feed the working poor. I also volunteer for Red Cross on national disasters. I started doing that with Katrina I uh, am a disaster assessment manager. I, I go in, uh, and I that that's where I get my adrenaline rush now. Uh, is you know you're you're there and it's 24/7, and you have the same people and, and and really it's a disaster is no different than a live television show. It's just controlled chaos, and I thrive on that. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to say? Uh, to the fans out there, I, really, I want to thank you for it. Was a great ride. It really was. It was a great ride, and and thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. And your sister did. The, she did the baseball, right? Yeah. Um, David tried it at first, but we had a lot of other stuff to do and all. And my sister had five kids. And who better to work with teenagers, which most of these kids are 18, 19, 20 years old. Who better to work with kids and, and work within a budget than somebody who's got five kids? So she was in charge of it. I designed the concession systems and managed that. And I had someone who took care of it because I couldn't be there all the time. But I picked out the food products. And, um, I wanted to go into the ballpark and eat something besides a hot dog because I've gotten food poisoning multiple times from that. And so I wanted to sell pizza. And they thought I was crazy. Nobody's going to eat pizza on a hot summer's day. Well, I had one little oven the first year. The next year I had a pizza uh, stand. Uh, we built in a pizza stand because I was serving so many pizzas. The first year I sold 110,000 hot dogs. And I wrapped most of them, and I think half of them had chili. So <laughs> How much were they back then? Probably, uh, it's probably a buck. That's good. Um, I had people that would come by and just buy the hot dogs and take them home. <laughs> really? Wasn't good. Oh, no, they weren't. Now, see, there again, because I would have to eat that hot dog as much time as I was going to be out there. Wiener King was big back then when we first opened the ballpark, and the people who sold Wiener King came by the ballpark and explained what hot dogs were to me. I, I was <laughs> really naive about that. But they, he said, you've got all meat or you got everything else. I mean, that's beaks, everything else. And so I never bought their product. But uh, I did a deal with Armor. Uh, it was a specially made hot dog for us. And I get them in 10-pound boxes. If I put them in the boiling water and came up with that much grease on it, that means that they were cutting, they had too much fat in them, I'd send the whole load back. Really? So I had good hot dogs because I ate them. And yeah, if it says all meat or something, you know, that's, that's the way to go. If it's, we go to some of these ballparks and places and you've got the so-and-so JCs are sponsoring it for us. That means they did all the, the local leg work and got the ticket locations and stuff. And uh, we'd split it like 30-70 or something, the, the gate. And uh, they'd have their concessions, oh, a hot dog and stuff. And you've been driving all day and you're starving. You go eat a hot dog. Well, that hot dog <laughs> isn't any good, yeah. and it would tear you up. We had a, a time um, we were in Louisiana, and it, we were doing a pay-per-view, and it was hometown of one of the guys 
that was on our crew, Moses, Moses Williams. And Moses wanted to show us the local cuisine. And so he was going to do a crayfish dish. And he did, and he fed the whole crew. And you're talking maybe up to 100 people when we come in there for a full setup. Well, there was a little something wrong with the crayfish. And it was, I mean, pretty much everybody got the shits. But that's not good during the pay-per-view because you don't have any commercial breaks. And I'm at the ring, and the, the way they had, they had Dusty Rhodes and I think Magnum and somebody else, and uh, they, we had the ring behind the announcers. They had the announcer platform was, of course, you know, up in here, and then you had the fans in the ring. And they went, they were going to go to an uh, interview with somebody, and I threw that, I had to go, I threw that camera down, I took off running, and Dusty's going, look at the excitement, Jackie Crockett running across the floor. <laughs> I was looking for a bathroom. That's the one thing I hate about my job is that if I'm out somewhere and I have to go, there's nowhere to go unless you, if you have to do number two. Oh, yeah. But if there's some woods around, that's all right. But yeah, I mean, we would start up with some of these pay-per-views and you start off two hours live on TBS. Then you go to a three-hour pay-per-view. So you're out there for five hours and there's no breaks. So I used to, I smoked cigarettes and uh, you know, whenever the, we get in between matches, they're going to go to the announcer for a couple of minutes. I go under the ring and smoke a cigarette. Did you used to have a, like a red hair or brown little afro? No. Okay. Some guy sent me a picture. He used to take pictures with you guys, and he said it was you. But I have it, but I don't have an image of it with me here. I, I, like it. I wanted to show it to you. No, it's, my hair is always, it's, they were, it was blonde or brown. Yeah, it must have been, it looked kind of reddish to me, but maybe. Well. No, I had some, if I had a beard, it, it, there was some red in that. Oh. So I had a beard for a little while. I'll show it to you somewhere down the road. Probably. Yeah, because if this works out, I'll get, uh, you know, David lives in Charlotte over at Dilworth. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy's in Texas, but. Uh, now, people, and I'm talking to you because you, you know I'm your brother, but people have told me, like, they don't give a shit about wrestling anymore, which I understand, but I mean. Well, Jimmy got fucked over pretty well, but you know, I had fun with it. Yeah. And Jimmy and David were like the office, and I, I was never, um, you know, I go to the stockholders meetings and stuff. I talk with the guys, um, but you know, as to who won or or whatever, I didn't care about that. What I cared about is were they facing the camera. I had to teach all these people about you know. You can go out and do the most exciting thing in the world, and there's, you know, ten thousand people on three sides of you. There's a hundred thousand, or you know, there's a million people on the other side of that glass. You need to antagonize all of these people, or get them cheering, and then turn to the camera, or start with the camera, go to them, and come back. And that's when we started doing the, like the entrances and things. Somebody, especially with Disney, because we do three or four shows a day. These guys would come in and I'd have to train them. This is your 15 seconds. This is when there's nothing else on the show but you. You can come through, you can present your personality if you're new, you can present your issue. I'm gonna kick somebody's ass, I'm going for the championship. Uh, this guy wronged me, I'm gonna make it. Whatever, that's a little 15 second interview. This is your time. If you're gonna run past me, then I'm wasting my fucking time out here. Why don't you go home? And I would go back in the in the dress rooms between shows and chew anybody's ass out. Flair, um, he came to us and he was a greaseball from Minnesota. And that was back, uh, I used to wear a $10 gold piece. That's when I was going to all the strip clubs in Charlotte. And the guys would go, it was good for their business, so they let us in free. And, they give us the drinks and stuff because the people would, that were there would talk about it and bring other people later on. Sammy Tillman at the Paper Doll and stuff. But I had the $10 gold piece and stuff. My father told me to take Flair out and dress him. He came in there, he had like checkered pants and a striped shirt on or something. It looked like he just got out of the circus. And the grease back hair stopped right here. And I was taking him out to the clothing store and he was looking at, oh, I really like that, the gold piece. I said, well, I'll get you one. He said, oh, I want a 20. And that's where we picked up on that flare 
the name and the pomp and the pageantry, and that's when we started going with the color and the robes and, and all of that stuff. And that's, we brought that piece of his personality out. Because you, you couldn't, you can't make somebody something they're not. You have to take a piece of them and magnify it. Uh, back in the days before the satellite and stuff, you could, you could make anybody anything. We had black guys that called them Indians. Um, but you could do anything then because no, everybody didn't know about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, for people that don't know, you know what you did behind the scenes, people that are going to see this, just kind of tell them what you did. You were like you were setting things up. You were the, but you were still involved with the with the wrestling part of it. You were the cameraman. You operated the camera. You ran. The I was secretary and treasurer of Jim Crockett Promotions. Uh, I operated the. Uh, all the cameras were started out with a 16 millimeter mag stripe film. I shot uh, the first time people went into the Coliseums and actually shot the finish of the matches to put on the, the, the TV shows. Uh, I was uh, eventually, I was called senior camera, senior crew. Um, we'd come up with the most ridiculous ideas that you could think of and create them. Okay. Um, well, it's just because we used to, the towns, you would ride p with people to Richmond. We ran certain towns on certain days, three towns a night, seven nights a week is the way it ended up uh, before my father died. And you carpooled with people and you're sitting in, you're going to Richmond, Virginia. It's a six hour drive and you start throwing crazy ideas around. Uh, Jimmy Valiant had to, to get an operation. So we show him getting hurt on TV, and he had to go, and uh, he ended up, we were in a, a really bad part of Charlotte, and he had like been on a supposed drunk, and he was gonna come back and, and gonna do good, and his wife pulls up in a limousine and picks him up out of the dirt. The next shot, he's pulling in, it was actually the Rock Hill Coliseum where we did this. We show him pulling in, and he goes to the ring, and his wife, whose name was Big Mama, and when they went to the plastic surgeon to have her breast enlarged, they were asked, how large do you want them? And Jimmy said, how large can you make them? And that's where they went. And that's why she got called Big Mama. We brought Big Mama out at the top of the Coliseum, walked her all the way down into the ring, and you know, Jimmy Vay was back wrestling with his valet Big Mama. Tell me, tell me about your dad. Tell, tell me kind of how all this got started, or what you can tell me. Well, <clears throat> I know I used to run the boxing matches at the uh, arena in Charlotte. It's where the old Park Center is, near the uh, behind Central Piedmont. And he would put a wrestling match in, which at that time was actually illegal. Wrestling wasn't a recognized sport. He would put a, a demonstration match of the wrestling, and people really enjoyed that. And wrestling sort of came from that. The arena ended up burning down, you know, a lightning strike or something. And we ended up buying a river house, or building a river house out of some of the scrap. And the river house actually ended up burning down. A lightning strike, a neighbor saw it, it arced from one air conditioning unit to another, and toasted that. But he started doing the wrestling from that stage. I think I was the only one when I was born that he was actually in town. Uh, my sisters, my two brothers, my father was out of town doing a show. He used to travel to all these towns. And that's when later on, like the Joe Mernick would take care of the, the towns north of Charlotte. Henry Marcus would take care of the South Carolina towns and stuff. Um, we had another gentleman, uh, Paul Winkhouse, would do Asheville. And we'd run Asheville <clears throat> on Wednesday nights, and those were the, we, that's to give guys work that weren't on TV. On Wednesday nights, we used to run Charlotte TV in Raleigh, and those were the, the main shows that we would bicycle around. Talk about, you said you guys did three towns a night for like 50 years, I think. Yeah. Just talk about how demanding that is and how many people you employed and, and how, how, how <coughs> I guess that meant business was good. 
<coughs> business was, was fairly good. Most of the time, because I did payroll for a while, we'd have about 55 wrestlers and, and referees. During uh, the holiday season, especially Christmas, they could reach up to 120 because you'd have your midgets, your girls, uh, different sort of attractions would come in on the holiday to try to draw the one person who, you know, oh, I don't want to go to wrestling. Well, they've got girls wrestling. Oh, okay. Well, that's the only time you do it because it's not a regular draw for something like that or midgets. But um, we were in Kings Mountain and uh, doing a, a show there, had midgets in the ring, and this gentleman decided he was going to roll in the ring and beat the midgets up, and it was a midget tag team. He never got up off the ring. He rolled in under the bottom rope, and then four midgets beat him bad. Because I didn't see it. I had the, the doors closed, and I was you know, counting up the box office. And all of a sudden, the doors come springing open. And I look up, and the guy's got whelps all over him. He's all torn up, and the cops have got him like that. And they said, oh, yeah, you're going downtown and tell everybody the midgets beat you up. <laughs> uh, well, tell me a little bit more about your dad. What kind of, what kind of man was he? Man of his word. That was... Uh, the thing that, that everybody that he ever dealt with is when he said something, that's it. If you say the show is going to start at 8.15, it starts at 8.15. If you tell people that you have such and such a talent that's coming, then they're going to be there. And it was pretty much written in concrete. One of the uh, problems we ended up having one time was Ray Charles. He was in Charlotte, the building was sold out. and. He had uh, done a little bit too much of his medication, and he was across the street, unable to come perform. But he was right across the street the holiday end. But um, yeah, when we said a show was coming, it would be coming. When we would call the building and book a date, that date was booked. They, we didn't have to have contracts. Because he was a very well respected, I guess is what you're trying to say. Yes, a man of his word. Um, tell me about, just besides, just kind of list the other events he ran, like besides wrestling, you kind of say, you know, he ran the wrestling, but he also did this, this, and this, just so people know. He did the Dick Clark Road Shows, Motown Road Shows. Um, he helped co-promote the, the Beatles in Atlanta on their first tour. He did the Harlem Globetrotters. He originated uh, working with them, with Maury and Abe Saperstein, who were the creators. Uh, towards the end of that, George Gillette ended up buying the Globetrotters later on. But I used to promote 53 dates a year with the Harlem Globetrotters. The number of times we promoted James Brown was innumerable. And, but back then, there wasn't any problem. I'd be the only snowflake in the building. And I never had any problems. But it was like you asked me before, but uh, what I would do I, I would, used to go to shows when I was young. The people in the building, especially Park Center, used to smoke so many cigarettes that my eyes would just run with water. And my father would have to have somebody take me outside. But it was uh, the same people were there every week. They would come up to the box office and ask us, who's wrestling? But they had their money out, and this, these were the same tickets they wanted every week. So you guys did all these other events, but wrestling seemed to be the most rewarding to you, your family. Yes, uh, because my father was honest, when a tour was coming through the South, they knew who to call to promote some dates so they don't have to go just from Washington to Atlanta or and then Miami or something like that. We could do Richmond, Virginia, uh, any of the towns because of the wrestling. We knew the, the building managers and stuff, and we could tell them the available dates quickly enough. All right, I'm going to ask you about a couple of wrestlers from that time period, you don't remember them or don't know anything about them or how they were in the ring, just they ignore them. But uh, it was a tag team, the Bolos. <laughs> Tom Ernesto, that was one of them. They used to take the object and put it in their mask. That was when I was real young because uh, Channel 3, <clears throat> Channel 3, we were taping a show and my father had me come out holding a coconut head that someone had drawn the Bolo face on and talking about oh, how hard the Bolo's head was. But he used to take, it was just a piece of tape that was folded several times. And it's uh, the obviousness of it, because your partner distracts the referee, always the stupid referee turning his back. And he would take it and telegraph it, that he's putting something in his head. And everybody's, oh, oh, oh. 
He does the deal, he pulls it out, puts it back in his boot, and covers the guy one, two, three. And they, they were probably, I guess, from what I read, the most hated of that era. Yeah, back then, that was, uh, the heels were really heels. And then people really hated them, but, uh, yeah, all I can remember is some of the, the baby faces like, uh, How about uh, George Becker? You remember him? <laughs> he would do that all the time when he was coming. He used to book our matches and stuff. And uh, oh, the man was old when I first knew him. He never did change. He was always bald-headed. But uh, we used to have an office over at 1111 East Moorhead. And there was two rooms. And uh, the big office had the big desk. And you had uh, George Becker over here. and. Uh, Angelo Martinelli would sit over here and help because we used to pay the guys in cash. You get $35 guarantee, $45 if you main event. And then, of course, if you had a big house, percentages would come in after that. But it was 35 to 45 and they come in and sign for it. But, uh, yeah, Becker used to book the matches. How, why was he so the, big, the big star, the main big baby face back then, I guess? Those because he booked the matches. <laughs> What about, uh, what do you remember about Johnny Weaver and the ring? Um, Johnny Weaver's a good wrestler. He would, uh, he had his sleeper hole that he used. He was a good number two man because he was uh, George Becker's second. So Johnny would take most of the punishment, the backdrops and arm drags and this, that, and the other. And, Give him to Becker and let him finish him. Okay. Um, now your father ran it from the 30s to the for what late 60s, early 70s, a little bit. Yeah. And he passed away. Kind of just well, talk about what happened when your father passed and what happened with the company and then the wrestling because it was Jim Crockett promotions, but then it was the wrestling and it was all kind of divided, wasn't it? Or it the wrestling was kind of just separated from everything else. The wrestlers were separated. We were part of the National Wrestling Alliance. We had our uh, 18 television stations that ran our show and stuff in the, the Carolinas and Virginia. And it was just, that was a separate entity. When we had been working in the business, all of our, not all of our lives, but for a long time, when my father passed away, and we had already influenced a lot of things that were going on, he had backed off. And we had, all of us had our own Forte. Jimmy uh, was, he's the oldest son. He was going to take over the presidency. But we're all equal stockholders. So when it comes time, the stockholders meeting, one time we went over to the, the lawyer's office and the temperature in the, that particular room went up 20 degrees while we were having our discussion. But Jimmy was uh, the, the president. David, who came in much later, that's when I was shooting interviews and things. Uh, he came in, he started wrestling at first, and he has asthma, <clears throat> and he was having a match somewhere, and he started blowing blood. Well, my mother heard about that, so David didn't wrestle anymore. He became an, the announcer, and he would do the interviews for me and stuff, and but David became the, the suit. He's the country club guy. He's the guy who would sell the TV shows and things. Me, I just did the TV. I, I did... Uh, the rock and roll shows, and, um, no suit for me. If I ever wear a suit, it's, will the defendant please stand up? That's when I wear a suit and tie. So it's from what you're telling me, you guys are kind of already hands on with the wrestling before your father passed. Oh yeah. Well then just kind of talk to me about his passing. I mean, I guess, that, I mean, obviously it was a big loss for your family, but. Very how sudden. Did it, how did it affect the wrestling? I guess it really didn't affect it that much from what you're telling me. No, <clears throat> you have a certain flow with the wrestling. You have a main event that's going into a town that f weeks before that would have been a semifinal match. Something to help start giving it history. You don't put a main event in cold into a building. You either start it off of the television show where somebody snuck in the ring and interfered with somebody, so now it's going to be, instead of a single match, it's going to be a tag team match. And then they'd run the time limit, 
So there's, there's a program that's already figured out for the matches as to you know, where it's going to go. You know, this time they go into the Coliseum, oh, well, the time limit ran out. Next time you come back, there's going to be no time limit. Uh, somebody interfered in the match, the guy gets disqualified. Next time it's no disqualification. So there's, there's steps to things. So he died very suddenly, but there was already a flow going on. And we were active in the day-to-day -day activities of the company. Okay. So, um, yeah, it, uh, then about that time, that's when uh, Vince Jr. started saying he was going to take over the world. And we went from Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, and we bought the Georgia, which had Turner's, uh, the TBS station, which was World Championship Wrestling. And so in order to be a world dame, you don't want to stay with Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling running a TV show in California. You know, they think you're a hillbilly. But if it's World Championship Wrestling, you hook into it. So, so kind of tell me how you guys got onto that TBS. I know from what I've, been, I've read, it's, you guys had to buy it from the time from Vince because he had, he had purchased it from Turner or, or Georgia, and then eventually you guys had to come in and get it. I'm not sure about that part of it there again. Um, that's the front office. I just, I was television. I didn't care about the rest of it. Okay, well then, then I'll ask you this. Um, just being a board member, did you think it was smart to go ahead and start trying to go after Vince like he was doing? Or did you well, that was protection. We weren't going after him. It was protection. And then also we found out how much money we could make off our television show if we had national syndication. The ad, the advertising time, you have like seven and a half minutes in a show that you can run your commercials or interviews or, or whatever. And so the show is going out to 253 stations across the United States. Obviously we're not going to run shows in a lot of that so we could sell our ads. That's why we bought uh, Texas. That gave us our national syndication, and they all, they had California stations and stuff all through the Midwest. When you say Texas, is that the Bill Watts? Was that from Bill Watts? Yeah. When it, what was the reasoning for buying that and moving? Then they move. Didn't your brother move out to Dallas after that? Move headquarters out there. What was all? Well, the, because of the well, we're running towns out there. They, you know, we were running three towns a night. They were running a lot of towns as well. And they needed somebody to oversee that. And our organization was pretty well settled in. Um, we knew who did what and whose responsibility things were. We, for the finishes and the flows of the match, we don't do that. You hire somebody, you get an ex-wrestler or a current wrestler, somebody who knows how people wrestle. And if they don't work out after a while, you change them out. That's all. It's just like a coach for a football team. Now, Ric Flair has been on record saying that they went to Dallas to get into the movie business. Can you shed any light on that? Or no. That's not true? I don't know. You don't know? No. I never heard of that one. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, were there any plans for you to go worldwide even without the pressure from Dennis? before the talks over the No. Everything was pretty much going to stay as it was. We had our uh, alliance. We were, as people were getting older, we were making offers to purchase their territories, but not at the, the rate that we did it after Junior decided he was going to take over the world. And I guess that kind of shows the difference between the Crockett's and McMahon. He was just going in and taking over, and you guys were we bought being, Curtis, being Curtis. Yeah, no, it's a business. Just kind of talk about that. He was just kind of going in and running them down, and you guys at least. He, he, would, he would book the build, just the big buildings and stuff. And like with the Globetrotters, I used to book the dates for that three and four years ahead in order to get – because. The Globetrotters traveled by bus, so they didn't want towns that were over 300 miles apart. And to route 53 dates going down this side of the Mississippi, 
<clears throat> you'd have to book out early. The circus does it 10 or 12 years out. So, but Vince was started booking his shows a couple of years out. And so it was going to happen. And he was trying to get a lot of buildings to sign exclusivity rights to him, but they couldn't do it. Um, but he, uh, you just have to protect yourself. So that's why you guys win. Yeah. And then plus we found out about national syndication. And we actually, the monies we could have made off of the television, we didn't need to do house matches. You need to do house matches in order to give the wrestlers the work that they needed. You mentioned uh, having a wrestler book the matches. And I, like the guy in the 70s was uh, George Scott. Uh-huh. Did real well. What do you think? A lot of people say he kind of helped you guys get a little bit more up. What do you What do you think of him? Oh, I think very much of him. He did a very good job. He, uh, he and Sandy uh, were good wrestlers. They... He was a very good booker, had a, a, a mind that could take a larger picture in. Sometimes you find out that the wrestler only thinks about this little thing with three towns a night running multiple states and then doing and growing quite a bit. He did an excellent job. And I don't know if this, there's any truth to this, but when your dad was running, there was mostly tag teams. And when he came in, it was... He kind of brought in the Johnny Valentine, the Wahoo McDaniel. The it was it was a lot of uh, tag teams, but <clears throat> you also had guys like Haystack Calhoun. He was a single act. He traveled around, but he was one of the guys that nobody let him ride with him because he was so big. He'd blow the springs out of your car. He used to drive around the big international, lean this way. <laughs> but you had a lot of single acts that came around because you had Gorgeous George. He was the first color in the wrestling. He would come out, and his wife was the valet. <clears throat> I wonder if I can get something to drink here. My voice is going. I got a cooler out in the car. Sure. I know I'm probably wondering some. Tim Woods. Yeah, what do you remember about that and how? I was at Roanoke, Virginia. I was actually supposed to be on that flight, and I traded with David. He flew in. Everybody on the right side of the airplane had a broken back from one degree to another. Uh, from the pilot who was killed, Johnny Valentine ended up, ended up in crutches and braces. Uh, Tim, Tim Woods was bruised from head to toe. He got on the plane that I flew in on. I had to help him actually carry him up the steps into the seat. He was crying. He hurt so bad. But there was nothing broken. Bob Bruckers, he had a, a broken back. Flair had a broken back. I used to come up, I pretty much covered the night shift. We couldn't hire the, the police or anything and make sure people wouldn't bother Flair, because you had doctors and stuff coming and wanting autographs in the middle of the night. And Flair was, he was stretched out so long, the gas would build up in his stomach. And we'd sit there and watch TV, and I'd rub his stomach so he could fart. How much closer you want to get to somebody? <laughs> I don't know, but how, how, uh, how did that affect the business that you guys were doing at that time, man? Well. It took away one of your top guys, or two, two of them, actually. Yeah. Because Brokers couldn't take a body slam anymore. He might separate his back. Valentine, that was a horrible waste of huge talent. He was, Johnny Valentine, I used to take tickets to Park Center. And after the things slowed down and stuff, I'd go down and watch the last couple of matches. Sometimes our crowds weren't so good, so I could sit third or fourth row. And Johnny Valentine would get you into a corner and he would come down on you, boom! And then he steps back and he drops his arm and you hear him, hit me! Boom, you hit him. He pushes you back into the corner. He comes down with that forearm and he's rattling your teeth. Boom! And he steps back, hit me! 
He does this two or three times. You see, he gets goosebumps. His nipples would get hard, and he would beat you ass all over that room. Oh, he was he was a huge talent. All right, now what do you think of Dusty Rhodes? He was brought in to run the show. What do you think of him? Well, Dusty, Dusty's a good talent. He had to be reined in a few times, I think, but. He did a good job, and uh, he kept his character in line. He didn't try to promote himself so much like Becker used to. He did a he did an okay job, but it was a, a very much a collaborative. We had a, a large office with a big meeting table, and when the programs and things were discussed, everybody's suggestions were taken into consideration because it was becoming such a huge business. It used to be you go into a town and you draw two or three hundred people. It's, it's okay. That's back when guys were making thirty-five dollars a night, but gas was a quarter. <laughs> so it's uh, it became pretty big. I used to write the checks and stuff, and you know, one hundred fifty thousand or was not out of the question for a week. And so Flair got a lot of those and whatnot. I gave some people some bogus checks too. I'd start off with a hundred thousand. I'd start deducting stuff. They'd end up with about twenty bucks. Talk about Ric Flair during the. I know he got big, built up in the seventies, but just talk about what he meant to Jim Crockett Promotions in the eighties. I mean, the eighties, he became you know the NWA champion, and he was people. He was people's guy for a long time. Yeah, uh, Flair was one of the kind of guys you love to hate. He was a, a baby face if you needed him to be. He was a heel if you needed him to be. He had a good talent. He worked very hard. And he, he would sell for the other wrestlers and then he'd you know, come back and do his job. We had a, I told you about the match in Asheville. You wanna know about that one? Okay. He came back from a tour of Japan and we were shooting television in Asheville. He came in right, right off the plane, bright white neon trunks. And I'm down at the ring, and they do a slam, and he gets up. And I'm, oh, is the ring dirty? Is a brown spot about like this on the back of his pants? Oh, something on the ring. Okay. He takes another slam. The spot's getting bigger. He had his upset tummy. He took the third one, and the back of his pants are brown. And so we like, okay, we cut it off. <laughs> no championship match today. But, I mean, we shut the TV down. They went ahead. After I told them we were off, they finished it. People uh, talk to, they use this term called a dusty finish. Do you, are you familiar with that? Probably, but I didn't. Go ahead. It's where he would be re wrestling player for the title. The referee would take a bump, and then he'd cover player one, two, three, and, the rest, and, then get, and they say, a lot of people say that hurt the business that you guys were doing. What, is it, what do you think about the term dusty finish? I don't know if that was a dusty finish. A lot of guys used it. It most of the stuff that you do is to create interest in the next match. Oh, okay. Well, if the referee took the bump and somebody else won well, next match, you'll have two referees, or no referee. It just it's a step to the the next trying. People will pay if you get them pissed off. They want to pay to see this person get beat up. So, and they jump up in, in front of their TV going like the referee, oh, I, that boy's stupider than I am. And it gives them a good release to yell and scream like that, and they enjoyed it. So you don't like the term dusty finish? I never really heard it. It's, that's an old finish, and I don't, I don't, no, i tell you the truth, I never heard that one before. Okay. but. He may, have, he may have used it a lot. What I paid attention to mostly was the top and bottom of that picture. I couldn't, a lot of times I'd walk away from a and I couldn't tell you who won. But I know that I had it shot properly. So I, pay, I was paying attention to the entire picture. Right, Starcade. What do you think? What did you think of Starcade and all the ones that came after that? It was a good endeavor. It was some of the first pay-per-views that were of wrestling that were being put out. 
some funny stories came out of several of them. Uh, well, no, that was Jim Crockett Memorial Cup in New Orleans. That's where we lost uh, Nikita Koloff. That's when we used to have our own airplanes, and we were partying. I don't know if I should tell them Nikita's very religious now. He doesn't. I haven't talked to him yet. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you that story. <laughs> they used to be all held in Greensboro, the Starcades, and then they did one in Chicago. And did you think that was a smart move to move it out of there after it was kind of built as the Greensboro show? We had to. You needed to expand the business. You can't stay with one place. Vince was was growing, and you had to to show that we were becoming national or international. So it was a good move to get it out of Greensboro. Yes, well, Greensboro was a good town. We still. Tried to put a you know a big show in there once a month, uh, second Sunday or something. Did you like Ronnie Garvin as the world champion? Yeah. He's always Ronnie Garvin. He's he's another tough guy. He was small. People would pick on him in bars, and he would tear them up. He's the kind of guy you could beat with a two by four. He didn't go bleed. He didn't go scratching. We had a. <clears throat> There was a gym that opened in Charlotte, and the guy said all the wrestlers and their families and stuff it could work out for free. My son went down there to uh, get a membership, and there was a preliminary wrestler down there. I don't remember his name right now. He didn't last much longer after this. But he told the guy that my son was not part of wrestling, and the gentleman asked my son to leave, which embarrassed him. I found out about it. We were there again <clears throat> shooting a match in um, Asheville, and I pitted. There was we needed to put a match in the ring. A, we called it dark match when we were rolling tape in the truck. So I pitted Ronnie Garvin against this gentleman, who was wearing the full uh, leotard, starts with the strap and it runs all the way down. Before the match was over. Ronnie had hooked him up. Ronnie would hook you up where you couldn't move, and he always had a free hand. And he would slap you to where you're just bright tomato red. He pulled this guy's leotard almost past his butt and had him locked up like this and was beating him. Because I talked to him before the match and asked him to do me a favor. <laughs> and the referee, Tommy Young, came over and he's looking at me. He says, i got to stop this. And I said, I'll fire you. Tommy went over and sat in the corner, and Ronnie just whipped this guy, and the guy came crawling out of the ring. I said, don't you ever fuck with my son or any of my family. I was not the one to cross, be crossed. Uh, when you see this, what, bring, what memories of the Four Horsemen, what do you remember about those guys in that group? See well, Tully Blanchard. We had Gene Arn Anderson and Lars originally. And it was a, a good combination. You could do a lot of things with. They were very talented, good interviews. Sometimes you'd have to put somebody with, team them up with somebody else because one guy can't talk. He could wrestle, but he, he didn't have a good mouth on him. That's where you had your uh, valets and, and whatnot would come in. And back then you guys had to put more than one interview on at one time to get, get them all on is what they how the story went, I think. They said they all just had to run, were running out of time when they had to do the interview and they all four just happened to be there. Is that kind of how it went? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of things that happened in the moment that would carry through. It's because you plan for things and of course they don't always stay the same. It was, um, it was just something that needed to, somebody else needed to, because Gene Anderson didn't talk. Um, Tully was a good mouthpiece. Matter of fact, he uh, goes around preaching at churches now. He's a good talker. So you needed you needed people in there to help. Uh, what do you think of the Rock and Roll Express? <laughs> well, you still see them wrestle. <laughs> they are still wrestling. What do you think about that? Don't still, Ricky Morton's still going out there wrestling. More power to him. He's got so many kids, he's got to keep doing it. I don't even think he's got 15. Every time I saw him, he, he takes them with him when he goes places. He could take a bus. So, they would do 
between the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express. That was a, a money-making combo. You had uh, the Rock and Roll Express, the kids loved them. Everybody was immolating them, wanting to be the, the buying their stuff. So when the souvenirs were just starting to come out too. We were doing a, a contest on television to be a valet for the Rock and Roll Express. And all these girls were sitting in pictures and stuff. And we used to, <coughs> office of Briarbin, I had one camera I shot the interviews with. And of course then it was video and I've sent it to, we had our truck and we're sending it to different machines and stuff. I had the right side was baby faces and you turn to the left a couple of feet and there's the, the line, this is where your heels <coughs> do their interviews, which worked out well because they could, they could hear one interview and they could respond to it. It wasn't such a cold deal, but I went out to get a, uh, some more coffee or something, and I think it was the only guy that sent in a picture. He was dressed up like rock and roll, little slender guy, and he's got in a pose like this. And I came running back in, going, we got a winner, we got a winner, this is your valet for the next month. And showed him the picture, nah, we quit, we quit, we're out of here. But, you know, they're very talented. Uh, they work with you, they do anything that you want them to. They're flyers. Uh, a lot, a lot of action around the ring, not so much the, uh, like a Johnny Valentine. He's in on top of it and he's stuck to you like glue. Rock and roll, was, they were flyers. They're kind of like the, what do you see, the Mexican wrestling that's in Vince's stuff now. They're flyers. And the, the Mexicans, they change a mask and come back as somebody else the next match. They were probably the biggest tag team you guys had in that era, right? Yeah, they sold some buildings out. We uh, sold out Memorial Stadium in Charlotte, doing a, a show there. We did, a, I forget, I may have won one of the first Starcades. The traffic, it was a sellout in Greensboro, and they double-decked the building then. And uh, traffic was blocked up for miles around. You couldn't get to it. The interstate was, was stopped up, people trying to get to the show. That's impressive. Back then, you know, they don't do that now. Uh-uh. What do you remember when Magnum T.A. had his accident, Paul Ray? We were coming back from Greenville, South Carolina. <clears throat> we used to party at uh, Bennigan's. It's Sharon Amity right there across from South Park. It's not there now. It's Burger King or something. Oh, no, it used to be right next, right behind the Burger King. But we used to party our ass off in there. And we came back. We made the stop there. And it had been raining that night, and he took off at his Porsche, headed home, and it hydroplaned, and it paralyzed him. We took him, we got him into the hospital. I had, uh, I had to have security in there because everybody was trying to see him. All the nurses wanted to see the cute boy, and he couldn't move, and I didn't want him getting terrified because I don't think he realized the extent of the damage. And it was kind of funny. Uh, later on, a few days later, after everything had been stabilized, a nurse was giving him a tub or a, a bath in his bed, and he got an erection. And we went, oh, Cyclops lives, Cyclops lives, because we were all kind of worried the poor guy's going to be dead from the neck down. But uh, we took good care of him. He came out pretty well. He was the next big talent. The man was good looking. He had a good head on his shoulders. He could talk. He could wrestle. He he was going to go far. That was. He'd have made millions. Okay. Uh, why do you guys get the planes? Because of schedules. We wanted to do. On Sunday, <coughs> we would, um, you could run, say, Charlotte and Wilmington or whatever, and you have your underneath card go in. Well, Charlotte's 3 o'clock and say Wilmington's 6 o'clock. Well, Charlotte starts at 3 with the underneath. By the time that your main event is hitting here, you've started your show here. And so when they finish the match here, they would fly to, to so Wilmington and do another main event there. So we were spreading our talent out. 
And then plus uh, scheduling. We wanted to go this town, this town, that town. It was just hard to do and get people home. Uh, well, what happened? I mean, people wanted to know why did it, why did it stop? Why did you guys have to sell turn? And how, what was that transition like? I imagine you guys probably didn't want to want to get rid of it. Turn your camera off a second. Stuff you don't feel like talking about. Well, I don't. It doesn't. I mean, it was all of our faults. We ran out of money. We needed to sell. We needed to sell things, and we were offered a, quite a bit. And I thought I was going to retire. And I didn't want to work for Turner, but I ended up working for him for another nine and a half years because I knew the wrestling, and they didn't. Well, how do you remember that time in your life? It sounded like it was just a big party. Oh, uh, it was. It was the greatest time. You got to meet people. We do a show in Washington, D.C., and if the president wasn't in town, the, the head of Secret Service at that time was a fan. And so we could go over and walk around the White House, not where the tourists go. We could walk around. We didn't go up in their private chambers and stuff, but we could walk around and see the Oval Office. We went outside. And I said, what happens if somebody jumps the fence? The guy clicked his radio twice, and there must have been 25 lasers on me. Wow. People coming out of, you thought it was a tree? That's not a tree. That's a, it's hollow, and there's a guy in there. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. No, but, yeah. Um, Dusty Rose was big friends with uh, Willie Nelson. I want to say Waylon Jennings, but it's Willie Nelson. Well, Willie Nelson was doing a party at the White House. And he wanted to smoke a joint. He went to the, the roof of the White House and smoked his joint. Secret Service is up there. They're paid to look this way, not that way. They did what he wanted went back to the party. Jeez. <laughs> you know, Willie likes his pot. Yeah. Uh, well, last question. Just finish this sentence for me. When people look back on Jim Crockett promotions, I want them to remember, I want them to think of it as Good times. Uh, we promoted entertainment, various types of entertainment. There's people that know us through hockey or rock and roll or mostly wrestling. But we were entertainment, and we entertained millions of people. And I hope, obviously, successfully, the ratings and things were good. Uh, entertainment. All right. you, know, you want to say anything else? I, I think we covered pretty much. Yeah. No, I'll think of something later on, but we'll talk about it.